Uh, thank you uh, for your attending this closing seminar. I'm sure this will be an amazing keynote. And Carol Palmer is a wonderful friend of mine and very famous person already. And she's an associate uh, dean for academic affairs at the Youth of I School. And um, also, uh, I think she's leading uh, kind of allied education in high school context. I think that's very important work and uh, really her major area is uh, you know, data curation, data stewardship. And so this will be kind of right on target and it's very relevant for this community. Without further ado, here is Carol Palmer. Thank you, Sam. Um, let me know if any of the sound gets wonky or anything, but I'll just plow into things. It's really wonderful <laughs> to be here. Um, and I've come to as many sessions as I could and really uh, found it very stimulating. And it was especially nice to see, I felt very fortunate because um, many of the topics I planned to share with all of you uh, were already getting discussed um, in the other sessions. And so I'm hoping this will be valuable, but also quite complementary to some of the mm -hmm. things that have um, already taken place. So I'm joining you um, from the University of Washington in Seattle. And at the University of Washington, we're located um, on the lands and the waters of the Coast Salish peoples. And there are many tribes and bands. There's the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot nations. And this acknowledgement is really just one small step in honoring the Coast Salish people and their homelands. So in um, preparing to uh, join you today, <laughs> I couldn't help but reflect on um, 2003 yeah. when Dublin Core was in Seattle and in fact was the first time I ever went to Seattle. Um, so little did I know that you know, 11 years later I would relocate to the University of Washington. Um, I was drawn, it was my first Dublin Core and I was drawn to it because um, I really wanted to witness the DC collection description uh, working group. I wasn't part of the working group but I was enamored with the working group because uh, I had just embarked, we had just started what turned out to be a 10-year um, large-scale project, uh, a metadata federation project, um, where we were bringing together cultural heritage collections from across the country. And we were really promoting collection description. It was the beginning of developing a concept on um, um, you know, collection description and how we find emerging collections. And, um, so anyway, I, it was really nice to reflect and say, you know, mm -hmm. see there was, I was coming back. Mm -hmm. So um, this is sort of a, a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of sets of principles, the FAIR principles and the CARE principles. I'm gonna to touch on a number of, of concepts um, and two that I just wanted to cue up here are uh, discipline, responsive FAIR and evidential culture. And then as I tend to do always, um, sort of bringing this all back in the end to thinking about expertise and the workforce um, for the students that we educate or the people in your organizations who you're mentoring. So um, to set the scene, I did wanna talk a little bit about um, my orientation to curation and stewardship and particularly the notion of stewardship. For the last 15 years, I've been working in the area of data curation. Um, and I, I can say I've probably, you know, I've given dozens and dozens of talks and written papers on data curation, but I have only invoked the term stewardship mm -hmm. in a title or in a talk a couple of times. And um, what I've found is, you know, in those years we were really very much embraced the original definitions about you know, active curation. We wrote some papers trying to you know, set some foundations. We really um, you know, emphasized this idea of purposeful curation. And most of the work we were doing was in federation, um, supporting data sharing and really trying to um, <clears throat> optimize data for reuse. But I found recently um, with the new work that I'm working on, um, I really have started to think more about stewardship. And for me, what that means is sort of a, an additional layer, uh, additional lens that I bring to the problems of, of data. Um, and to me, that's really about um, becoming more accountable 
And so uh, starting to take up problems related to protection and integrity, which we'll talk quite a bit about today. And then it also, I found, has really started to uh, provoke in me sort of this questioning of, well, what is it that we're really stewarding? So I am going to talk a little bit, you know, be raising that question throughout what we talk about today. So I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was really excited to attend the panel moderated by Simon Hodson yesterday. Um, he gave a very eloquent overview of, um, you know, sort of the, the research environment now that's quite global um, and the, you know, the complex grand challenges that we're facing and the problems associated with that and the data um, problems that um, need to be solved in order to really support that work. Um, and just recently, my colleague, Melissa Cragen and I, Melissa's at the San Diego Supercomputing Center. She's chief uh, strategist for data initiatives there. We just um, have a paper in press entitled Curating for Convergence. And it really is about um, this, this trend in research um, and how we you know, really sort of match the investment we see happening in the US where it really is called convergence research, um, there's a you know, huge investment in uh, funding programs for convergence research. And so we make the argument in this paper that we should be um, investing sort of equally in preparing our workforce to really support that research that needs to be cross-domain, um, cross-disciplinary. And um, we use some case studies. We talk about some of the really interesting work, particularly drawing attention to um, you know, knowledge networks and knowledge graphs, which have been a big theme um, today. I know I missed those talks, but even uh, earlier in the conference. So it really was our opportunity to talk about, well, we need lots of professionals who can do federation interoperability, um, but we also believe there needs to be fundamental understanding of research practice and cultures. Um, and then this you know, additional perspective or lens that has to do with responsible stewardship. Um, then quite, quite uh, just a couple of weeks after we submitted our paper, which isn't out yet, um, I was really pleased to see that the Open Knowledge Network Roadmap uh, was released right at the end of September. And again, talking about um, you know, it being sort of the best in class opportunity um, to pr promote fair access to open data and that the you know, knowledge networks are really going to enable AI and, and machine learning ecosystems. And again, this focus um, on leveraging data for societal challenges. And they have some very nice um, use cases in one of the appendices for this uh, roadmap. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, it's really a nice piece. But the thing I was really encouraged to see is that they also um, really pick up on um, the idea of needing the foundation to be community centric, um, ethical, and re, you know, in order for us to have ethical, responsible systems. So, but of course, FAIR very much um, at the center of you know, the way they explain uh, open networks. So we've heard a lot about FAIR principles um, and I'm not going to belabor it any further, but I did wanna show this slide because I seriously laughed out loud when Arafan Gregory showed his slide the other day, um, which is basically the same slide that says metadata. That's what FAIR is all about. Um, so I use this um, slide in the classroom um, in, or in my foundations of data curation classes to you know, reinforce that very idea that everything we do almost every week has um, either you know, direct um, you know, practice in metadata or implications for metadata. But the thing I wanted to you know, use it here as a transition because really um, you know, pointing out the fact that reusable um, really is linked in the FAIR principles to this idea of domain relevant community standards. But I also wanted to draw attention to um, some of the recent work of the brilliant Carol Goble. You can't go wrong following Carol's lead. Um, and so she, you know, really pointing out the, this huge adoption of FAIR, all of the domain-based, disciplinary-based um, you know, research areas um, that are picking it up, also all the repository and open data initiatives, tremendous adoption 
and it's very really exciting. I've never seen anything like it in my career, but she also is <clears throat> really brought forward this idea of well, there's also you know the fair mythology, and to me that's just this sort of little bit of overloading we're doing with fair. And so she points out, well, fair is not a standard. You know, it's not inventing new protocols. It's not synonymous with um, sharing or open data, even though we tend to say fair sharing, um, you know, as, as a term. Um, and it's not about quality. And then again, it's not one size fits all. So one of the concepts I'd put up was um, uh, discipline responsive fair, and I really um, am enjoying seeing um, you know, the communities move towards a more discipline responsive uh, thinking about FAIR. Uh, for instance, there's the FAIR for Disciplines as part of the uh, discussion forums of FAIR data. Not nearly as much activity there as I would like, but um, you know, a lot of recognition of the importance of that. Um, again, in the classroom, even in a lot of talks that I give, I like to show this growth, you know, sort of this, um, really huge you know um you know acceleration of the number of standards so when i first pulled this slide together um, in 2015 the predecessor to fair sharing um, had um, you know about 700 standards listed and now there's 1300 seven years later um, the uh, registry re3 data um, um, at that time had a thousand repositories and now has 3000. Um, and I would say that the, you know, the prevalence of these new listings, not that they're all new repositories or standards, but they're newly registered. Um, many of them are domain-based. And so that's you know, really, I think another argument for why we, when we're thinking of FAIR, we shouldn't be forgetting that you know, we need to be discipline responsive. At the same time, there's that balance um, the need to put start putting equal emphasis on these structures for cross disciplinary optimization. And again, we heard a lot about that in Simon's panel um, covering the CBIF, and he pointed us to the World Fair um, work, which is also very important and um, very impressive. Another place we see um, fair, um, discipline responsive fair being discussed a lot is in the humanities. And um, one of the points they make that I think is very important is this idea that we sort of need to move beyond that technical notion of verification. Um, Todd Sifra talking about, you know, really the, the fear of losing rich description, the risk of that, um, that underlies the data integrity in the humanities. And she states, you know, fair principles of maximum reusability and interoperability cannot be achieved on an epistemic level even if they can be achieved technically without that you know, rich description and data integrity. But to balance that off, at the same time, we have other scholars in the humanities talking about FAIR in that, um, which I think is very valid, that FAIR um, is really inherent in some of the ways um, that you know, research is conducted in the humanities. And so in particular, the case of historical methods, where the integrity of the work is really sort of fair documentation, all the validation that's done that starts at the very beginning of you know, everything you consult um, so that you have that provenance track throughout, everything is contextualized. That's how the work is done. That's how the interpretation takes place. And that's how it's often described then in final research products. The other place I think we really um, want to be thinking about uh, verification or you know, disciplinary fair um, is the notion of reproducibility. And here I think probably a more precise alternative term that might be more productive for us is the idea of integrity of method. Um, so I put here, you know, we need to move beyond reproducibility as proxy. So again, this sort of this idea of overloading that we're taking a term that resonates very much. We have a reproducibility crisis, you know, all the fields are talking about it. This, you know, tons of papers out there from all sorts of different fields. Um, but when, when we work um, with our scientists to find out what they really need for um, reusing data, what purposes and such, um, our recent study, and there's been a few others um, that have shown that um, reuse of data, this is a case of earth system science where we surveyed um, scientists, everything, doing everything from, you know, 
on the ground field studies to very large scale climate modeling. And across that range of Earth system science, we find that first of all, 98% of our respondents were reusing data. Um, and 80% of those were using it for new analyses. After that, it was to compare results or background information, very small number um, who wanted to reuse data or even see data for reproducibility purposes. Even going so far as to make statements in the survey, it's not helpful, it's not applicable in field sciences, in modeling work, et cetera. So we're sort of doing a disservice when we bundle up all of these issues that I think have to do more with methods integrity um, than they do with reproducibility per se. Now, Sabina Lionelli has probably made the boldest statements about uh, this issue. She's gone so far as to say the uncritical pursuit of reproducibility as an overarching epistemic value is misleading and potentially damaging to scientific advancement. So I've talked a bit now about all the, you know, the disciplinary responsiveness, but of course, I started out with convergence research, um, which requires this cross, also uh, attention to cross disciplinary responsiveness. And so here again, turning back to that idea of like, what are we stewarding? And I wanted to, um, you know, just highlight some work that Matt Mayernick at the National Center for Atmospheric Research has done, um, studying um, climate model intercomparison projects, where it looks to me, and this it's really a beautiful case study that what we're stewarding from that perspective are these practices of problem solving communities um, and the progress that they're making and stewarding their progress together. And so he also makes very firm statements. It's not happening through reproducibility, but the work of those communities to develop standards and metadata, common vocabularies, and increasingly uniform evaluation methods. So this cross-disciplinary responsiveness, we've also seen you know, how it shapes up um, in our own studies. This is a little bit of a glimpse at some work in geobiology that we've done um, in a very integrative science. And so um, bringing together physical, chemical, biological scientists who all do work at Yellowstone National Park on these, at these you know, geothermal features that you know, support work from, on everything from you know, the origins of life on earth to life on other planets. And there's a lot to say about this, but the bottom line is what we discovered is that what needed to be stewarded or uh, really was the sampling and site conditions at these features. And interestingly, you know, Simon brought up yesterday the need for being able you know, that the measurement level, that variable level is so important. And one of the you know, most important things we discovered was that it, we really don't only need scientists to document what's happening in the field campaign um, or you know, um, the, just the, you know, the sampling techniques. In fact, there was a, we discovered that there probably needs to be new measurements taken in the field so that over time, um, calibration could be done to understand the original state of um, the thermal feature because they change so rapidly. Like within two weeks, the traver travertine starts to build up very quickly. And so while the vent stays the same, you know, the structure of um, the, the, the feature itself will change. And so that sort of anchor measurement um, would be essential for them to reuse over time. So of course that got me thinking, what else should we be stewarding at these more grander, almost conceptual levels? Um, and I returned to then um, one of my favorite papers that really resonated um, again, especially with this new work um, that we're taking on with qualitative data. But this is um, Harry Collins's idea of evidential cultures. And this is a, a, a really classic study that um, is, is so resonant, but it's about um, uh, gravitational wave research and um, the two cultures, one's in Italy and one's in the US. And um, the, he tells a very nice story about how they have very different perspectives and philosophies about when um, uh, a, a, a gravitational wave data should be released. And so um, this, the Italian side is, uh, Italian labs on the side of, well, you know, we have some observations. They may be just a coincidence, but it's interesting enough and significant enough that we think we should this should be released to the community. 
and then they should be responsible for the inference. On the US side, very different perspective. Um, no, we don't release anything until we have it validated and we're confident you know, that it's a wave. Um, and so, and then that means that that lab is taking on that responsibility for inference. So, you know, what Collins is basically saying is this is sort of a, a, a balancing of the significance with the interpretive risk of, you know, this raw, raw data, for instance. And what I found going forward with um, some of the qualitative data work we're doing now that these these factors of significance and risk seem very, very important and seem to be something that's sort of missing in what we're capturing um, at present. Um, my colleagues at the Qualitative Data Repository, I wasn't involved in this paper, um, but I do admire it. And so, uh, and it struck me also that in many ways, they're talking about the same phenomena as Collins. Uh, they've they've um, developed this notion of epistemologically responsible reuse. And really it's uh, the idea of interpretive risk with qualitative research. And so they, this paper is about how repositories and curators in repositories should be working to help researchers be, a, you know, epistemologically responsible data reusers. So what does that mean? Um, it means you're helping them not make claims beyond what's justified, um, you know, justifiably can be inferred from the data. And this usually means, you know, really trying to um, get as much of the original data context as possible. Also representing what's missing, you know, that what the data producer would already instinctively know or just know because of their knowledge of the methods um, and the background. And also, particularly with um, qualitative work, to avoid over standardization. Other work I'm doing with um, the qualitative data repository is being led by um, a colleague here at the UW in the Information School, Nick Weber. And this is funded by the Sloan Foundation. And here the um, team is taking on some very um, interesting cases of trying to understand. Um, the risk uh, and the stewarding roles um, with particularly highly, highly sensitive qualitative data. And in picking these highly sensitive cases, it's really illuminating some very interesting things. So the, the project's called Privacy Encoding for Sensitive Data. And three of the um, focus areas have been um, work with the National Socio-Environmental uh, Synthesis Center, uh, SUSINC, um, looking at uh, research on very fragile environments where uh, there's need for protection of the sites. Um, and then a case study with the Guttmacher, Guttmacher Institute on Reproductive Health, where you can just imagine um, really uh, very important to protect identities of people. That case, I don't know that one intimately because I haven't been involved, but um, I find it fascinating because it's really setting up an expectation um, that we will be able to curate data in QDR from Guttmacher, primarily for preservation purposes, and that the curators actually are not going to be allowed to see the data. So we've got to figure out the processes and systems for that. So it reminds me of sort of the non-consumptive research that we see with data mining, you know, with copyrighted materials. So how do you build up our repository environment in order to support that? And then the, the study that I was leading was, um, and that I'll talk about more today, is a um, case study of scholars who are working on indigenous language and culture. And here the, you know, the risks and the protections are around you know, the indigenous knowledge itself. But interestingly, there's also this push to sort of reveal more than you might expect, reveal um, and relationships, which I'll talk quite a bit about. As part of that uh, case study, we developed a particular approach to working with the scholars. Um, and we're, we're calling it um, contextual integrity profiling. And basically it's a, a way to analyze, you know, this integrity of context. It's a collaborative process working with those scholars. Um, and really it's a foundation for contextual metadata where we document the content, you know, what are the products, research products, um, what's the important context from their uh, perspective and who are the stakeholders um, besides you know, the repository and the scholar, the others involved. Um, the idea of contextual integrity, uh, you may be familiar with and we've been inspired by it, but we're not really using Nissenbaum's 
um, you know, distinct uh, approach. Um, we were more just inspired by it. Um, but Nissenbaum's you know, concept has been widely, widely adopted. Again, very resonant for a lot of people working in privacy and other um, aspects of, of data reuse. And so really, you know, she talks about how um, privacy is all about the appropriate flow of information and that any privacy protections that need to be in place should be uh, determined by the norms of the context. And so for, you know, in her uh, scoping of that, you know, the, the focus is on data types, the particular circumstances and the actors. And you can see we're sort of doing the same thing with context, con content, context and stakeholders. That project, um, the PESDI project, um, and doing that case study led us to many, many questions and um, a lot more work we wanted to do. And so we have a new project now funded by the Mellon Foundation, where I've brought together a much larger team um, to really look at, um, it's called Data Services for um, Indigenous Scholarship and Sovereignty, um, DSIS. But really the tagline is, you know, stewarding indigenous research data with care. And care is the principles. And we have a, you know, a large collaboration uh, evolving for this, a number of um, researchers, scholars, and students here at the Information School. We have the Qualitative Data Repository, Kim Christian at Washington State University, who I'll talk more about in a minute, who um, works in cultural heritage, um, indigenous resources, and a lot, has done a lot of metadata work. Uh, we've brought in indigenous librarians from UBC, the Weewa Library there, who have deep experience working with indigenous um, scholars on their campus and our indigenous uh, scholars here at um, the Indian, American Indian Studies and our colleagues in data services at UW Libraries. And the collaboration is growing. We're now getting participants from um, data services in Canada as well. So our goal here is to try to put these care principles, which are fairly new, how do we move them into practice? Um, you know, we have the fair, um, the fair principles that, as we saw, very much around about metadata. But for care, metadata is not evident really at all. It's you know collective benefit, authority to control, you know responsibility and ethics, and there has been promotion and even Stephanie Carroll, who was one of the originators of this, you know, promoting this idea of be fair and care. Um, having been working with these communities for a while, I now think it probably should be, you know, care before you be fair or some, some twisting around of, of the statement. Um, but I also think we need to sort of step back and absorb and, and at least recognize that there were many, you know, decades ago, there were earlier principles that were really a way of sort of um, elaborating this idea of authority to control. So the um, OCAP principles from Canada, there's also some in New Zealand and Australia um, that focus more on ownership, control, access, and possession um, that, you know, just sort of shines a light on the fact that that authority to control is central, especially to the um, sovereignty aspect. So I, I wanted to share a little bit with you just so you can get a feel for what we're doing um, with the uh, contextual integrity uh, profiling. Uh, the phase one of the project is really scholar-based. We're, we're taking our lead from the scholars. We're enrolling more scholars, uh, developing case studies. But I thought I'd just give you some details on one so you can get um, yeah, just a, 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 some insights into what we're seeing. This is a, a, a the, the focus of this case is a project by uh, Chris Tutan, and it's a um, well. It just came. It's it's soon to be released as a book, but also parts of it will be published um, on Raven Space digital platform, um, which is an indigenous um, publishing platform that tries to also respect care principles. So it's a, a nice alignment for us. But the work itself um, has taken was a, a deep collaboration with a Cherokee elder. Uh, his name is Hastings Shade, and uh, Hastings Shade had, over his lifetime, um, collected over 600 animal and plant names, and he put them into little pamphlets, and he really selected them very purposefully as things that could be shared, you know, fairly widely. Um, unfortunately, very sadly, Hastings Shade died during the middle, passed away during the middle of the project, and 
but Chris was able to continue through collaboration with his wife and son. So these animal and plant names are really at risk ecological knowledge. Um, and uh, as I said, this book was sort of designed for a more general public, but as we've gotten to understand the, the case for more deeply, there are a number of data and research products that we think are also of tremendous value that either in terms of preservation or for um, potential access by scholars, not necessarily general public. But in terms of contextual integrity, you know, the integrity of context, just a few of the things that we know will need to be, again, start think about it in terms of metadata, what needs to be captured, what needs to be described. For Chris, as a scholar, the indigenous methods themselves are vital. And so he's developed a taxonomy. Um, he's done immense number of, you know, um, observations and, and um, interviews and, uh, capturing of stories um, to verify the plant and animal names. Um, and his work, as well as every scholar we've talked to so far, this notion of relational accountability is central to the method itself. And so we know um, in, in documenting method, we have to find a way to represent this. And so for Chris's project, relational accountability has to do with you know, the significance of these collaborators, the elders, their position, um, knowledge, connections to not just, you know, the community and other elders and knowledge holders, Cherokee knowledge holders, but also relationships to land and ancestors. Another really interesting dimension is this um, audience sort of lens because the book itself is meant for general it's meant to be educational for Cherokee peoples, but also the general public. Um, and Chris talks a lot about um, his work being, um, the, he doesn't talk about data. He doesn't talk about results. He talks about teachings. Um, and here we see, and we learned about from him is this risk that there are people who aren't ready to be taught. And so the book is you know, it's, uh, devoted to a certain audience. Um, and, but there are also other audiences where um, they may have more readiness for uh, a different kind of teaching that can, can come out of this data. And so the audience lens is also, um, will possibly change as we um, capture and package up other um, products from this research. And then fascinating, the arena of control has gotten very interesting. You know, we went into this project knowing that eventually we will need to engage with tribes um, where the data is being collected, um, assuming a little bit mistakenly that the tribes may have the final say in control and access, maybe even in how things are described. Um, and um, having worked now with on this project for a while, we now see that um, Chris, Dr. Tutan believes that it is the family um, that needs to have the, the base, you know, ultimate control of any um, ways in which these materials are represented or made accessible. So that's just sort of a taste of sort of the, the problems that are emerging. And again, I feel like all of this has you know, tremendous implications for what and how we describe um, you know, research coming from indigenous scholars and how we support them in our repositories. Phase two, we'll be working more closely then with QDR to do a demonstration. Um, QDR is in a dataverse repository environment. So we're very excited about um, being able to, you know, pro, um, have a prototype. I mentioned K uh, Kim Christian at uh, Washington State University, and she's been a key collaborator for us. Um, Kim has done a tremendous amount of work in cultural cultural heritage. You may have heard of Mukatu; it's pretty well known. Um, it's a content management system designed specifically for Indigenous peoples to, you know, develop their own collections with um, their own descriptions and protocols and protections. And um, she's involved with the local context project where there's been development of this labeling system called TK labels, uh, traditional knowledge labels. And again, many of you may have heard of them because they're starting to be very widely adopted. They're being adopted in other countries, but also Library of Congress, Smithsonian, uh, various museums um, can, really tailored to cultural heritage. And so this you can't really see the labels, the names on the labels, but they have to do, some of them are like seasonal, sacred, family, 
um, you know, trying to put a, a, a label on what's restricted to women, restricted to men. And we've learned through our work with um, uh, Kim that um, this labeling system, maybe the notices, you notices that we're exploring, you know, the um, protocols with the tribes might be appropriate, but that the labels themselves have to be developed um, with direct input um, from the tribes. And so they're not really appropriate for research data where the scholar is sort of the intermediary in between. And so we're gonna work with Kim to figure out, well, how do we extend this idea of the TK labels and make it appropriate for research data? And I really think um, this, these notions of significance and risk can be uh, a framing for that that will help us make progress. You know, there's another set of labels that, that were developed more recently that are for research and they're biocultural labels. Um, the local context group um, developed those with geneticists um, and tribes. And so again, tailored very specifically to genetic data. So our set, if we do an extension of any kind would be around uh, more qualitative um, indigenous scholarship. So, uh, you know, just thinking through, we're in early stages where we, we've had our worst, first workshop, we've got our case studies being developed, but I thought there, you know, there are some priorities and challenges ahead of us that I thought were worth uh, raising and sharing with you. Um, you know, it's very clear that we'll probably be very, very much producing more description than we will be providing access to any data. Um, so it's going to be metadata intensive. Uh, thus, we'll be adapting the QDR metadata application profile, which is, uh, uh, you know, developed and maps directly to DDI. And, you know, we learned yesterday in that same panel, um, you know, the strength of DDI for uh, representing methods, but particularly for survey work. Um, so again, there might be some uh, elaboration that needs to happen there. We haven't really even started to explore sources for vocabulary development yet. But in terms of just, you think about the locations, the relational accountability being tied directly to the land, um, there are a lot of counter mapping projects out there. Um, and there's one I have a little image of here uh, for the Coast Salish people, um, where there is an attempt to really put the tribal names with the, the, the land um, boundaries. Um, but there's also really interesting, more artistically based counter mapping um, in the Zuni. There's a set of a, a dozen or more maps that have been produced. And in working um, with one of the scholars, we learned that those maps are significant. Um, again, this raises a lot of challenges, not necessarily for what it shows about a certain location, but for what's missing. And what's missing resonates with those communities um, and is significant. So again, I'm not sure how that would help us um, with any vocabulary development, but it's good to know going into these counter map, exploring counter maps, you know, what, what to sort of look for. Some really interesting conflicts um, with existing norms, uh, you know, um, IRBs standardly looking for really uh, robust de-identification with quali qualitative data. We're learning that for relational accountability, um, there may be actually insistence on identifying certain uh, uh, tribes, certain um, elders, for instance, certain community members for that um, significance factor, almost for validation. And then we know we're gonna need to align uh, with policies and emerging standards. And Washington State has a very well newly developed uh, research engagement policy with, to, for work with tribes. I've contacted the Office of Research here to see if we might get something moving at a campus level here. Um, but also there are emerging standards that we're watching very closely at IEEE standard that um, again, Stephanie Carroll is leading, um, but we don't know much about where it's headed yet. And that's recommendations for provenance for indigenous people's data. So, I promised we'd um, you know, kind of get back to um, what the implications are for the workforce and expertise. And I hope this story you know, lays out for you sort of maybe some of the evolving expectations we might have for uh, those professionals who sit in our repositories or in our organizations and their work as curators and stewards. Um, it's kind of not fair I pulled this quote from a paper I really enjoy and that I use um, in teaching, uh, the Mannheimer and Hull. This is a paper on the STEP framework, which is a framework for thinking about 
curation of sensitive um, social media data. And um, again, it's a very nice framework for helping us understand sort of the risks involved and the steps to take in order to more um, carefully make data available. Um, but they do state in that paper, and this is from 2017, that data curators cannot be expected to be ethics experts. Now, there's a good reason for this because they go on to say, um, instead, we should be educators. We are the ones who should be educating researchers so that they can be their own ethics experts. And so I think that's, that's fair. But I also think more and more, and we're seeing this turn in the field more generally to you know, responsible, um, you know, responsible AI and responsible um, operations in our libraries, for instance. I do think our expectation should be shifting to uh, expectation for data stewards who are what I would call integrity experts. So what does that mean? And how, does, how would that change the principles? How would it change fairer care? Well, we might want to see things like very basic fundamental, do no harm. Um, and we had some nice talks last uh, yesterday about you know, protection. So you know, how do we protect things that need to be protected? How do we show respect for things that need to be respected? But then what about the significance? You know, that's about the risks. Significance is you know, how do we elevate those things that are significant, those relationships to the land that um, from the scholar's perspective, need to be part of any representation uh, of anything related to um, the information, the ecological information, for instance, coming um, from those special terms of the natural world. Um, and then something like, you know, prioritizing integrity um, and what that means within those particular evidential cultures. So we've seen you know, a couple of different instances here in climate modeling and geobiology, um, uh, earth system science, but now also qualitative indigenous scholarship. But that's not enough. We really do need to be convergence experts as well. This is where the rubber's hitting the road, the big, you know, grand challenges are sitting. And so, you know, in addition to all of that, you know, we need to optimize potential. So what does that mean? Um, this is sort of a daunting range of expertise. Um, you know, I, I kind of like to overwhelm my students with, you know, what all the things they need to master in order to be, you know, uh, curation professionals. Um, so, you know, I, I would argue with them, they need to understand the methods and cultures of the research communities that they work with. Um, and that is everything from this very, you know, very hyper local protective, you know, research integrity within something like indigenous data or, you know, the health reproductive health data um, that's you know that has certain implications for metadata policy and services but then all the way up to what you know really is this radically distributed but I would maybe call more generative um, you know uh, data environment so those 3,000 repositories and you know 1500 standards um, again, very daunting, but the potential is great. And so really understanding um, how to steward for research potential. And that's where the knowledge graphs and much of what you know, we've been talking about in some of the sessions here have been about. And so our, our, you know, our expertise for metadata policy, the services we provide, you know, really needing um, this range. So that, you know, that's a, that's a big challenge for workforce and professionalization. Um, I do think the demand is there though. Um, so one of my favorite um, reports that's out there now came out in 2018 from the European Commission, uh, the report on turning fair into reality. I really recommend this. It's really done a great job of encapsulating, you know, much of the challenges and, and what needs to happen. And so, um, you know, they've gone as far as to say the number of core data experts to effectively operate um, you know, the European Open Science Cloud is likely to exceed half a million within a decade. Um, and then that the technical expertise, you know, they need to, you know, those experts need to be proficient enough that they're working directly in consultation with the research teams. So they have that domain orientation. Um, and then the Open Knowledge Network uh, roadmap, um, you know, has some very um, compelling and convincing 
um, statements about this, the inordinate effort in assembling, integrating, and analyzing data curated by different organizations. So again, the expertise, the workforce needs are great. So we have a lot of great educational programs in library and information science. Um, and um, you know, I've tagged a few here, but there, there are others. I've been really, um, really compelled by the Metadata 2020 work where they're really highlighting you know, the, the stakeholders um, and you know, the interests there. Um, and then I just wanted to mention briefly some of the new work that we're doing to try to coordinate efforts, um, forward-looking sort of strategic efforts in information schools. So our information schools are fascinating now. They're full of experts you know, ranging from library information science to data science to biology to critical studies to science of science. Um, and we really have a lot of potential. So how is it that we actually leverage you know, that full range of expertise in our schools? Often we're a little bit more segmented than we should be. We have different programs, different admissions, you know, research teams and centers. Um, how do we do better you know, at bringing together all of that expertise? And Sam actually came to our um, session at the I conference uh, this year where we brought together the community to, to imagine, you know, how do we, what, what is it like to imagine, you know, 10 years of unprecedented progress in LIS research and education? And I'd like to think, you know, some of that progress could be really towards um, these workforce and professionalization efforts. Okay, so I think I managed to stay pretty well on time. I want to thank you for coming. I know it's hard to show up at the end of a conference, especially the virtual ones. Um, and so very, very happy to have had this opportunity um, and a very special, you know, Dublin Core experience again. Um, so it's caps off like the first, first one and then the most recent one um, will be very important for my trajectory of engagement with Dublin Core. Yeah, it is. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful and inspiring talk. And also is echoed by Tom Baker. And I think <laughs> not everyone sees that, but wonderful talk and very inspiring. Uh, thank you. Um, I was uh, muted. And uh, thank you for your participating this last three days and doubling core conference. And we have speakers from 17 different countries and majorities coming from USA, but there is many different countries. And the, the, in terms of organizations and a lot from universities and the libraries and archives and these job titles and librarians and professors. And let me announce the winner of the student paper is a Katie Colson and Cora Gottfried, uh, UIUC. I think Carol, you must be uh, proud of. And Makerspace Metadata Schema, supervised by the In Young Choi, the In Young Choi. And it's uh, one of the comments was an innovative case study that supports the, the fair uh, principle for a broad audience. Congratulations, such a good job. And we will uh, award 500 US dollars to them. This is announcing the DCMI 23 Meta Innovation. It will take place in Daegu, Korea. We are proposing uh, September 10th through, uh, and then October 10th through October 13th. And, um, and uh, it might change, but I think that this is what we are proposing unless we see a real problem. I think this is a enough distance from the ACES. It might be a pretty a good one. And the, this is a Tuesday and October 9th is a national holiday in Korea. So they may not be good. So we are uh, starting from Tuesday. And the, uh, after the conference, we are also planning and different, uh, potentially five different options. So with tour options, you can sign up to over Daegu and the city and vicinity, to over Seoul city walls, to over palace and the Pukchon village, uh, you know, Joseon dynasty, and uh, many of remnant of uh, the, the, the places and the nice uh, traditional uh, houses. And the two over Korea libraries and in you know, major libraries uh, and uh, two over Korea mediums, and you can sign up for those. And the, 
And uh, we are going to have a, a three minute uh, video presentation of Korea and Daegu. And uh, hope to see you all in, in Korea. And thank you very much for attending uh, this year's conference. So Sunny, now you can play the video. Okay, um, all good things must have an ending. Thank you very much. And hope to see you all in Korea next year. Thank you. Bye.